starting off on building my own adult life, figuring out where everything was going to go when everything shifted for me. We are change. I decided I'm going to write a screenplay. So from then on, life became a different challenge. You got change. She was cheated up. She said, it's Canada, Mom. Absolutely no regrets. Now a chance with my friends. A word of advice. Do not peak at 20 unless you plan to die young. You got change. Now for people who love change all the time, slow down. What does change mean to you? Does the thought fill you with excitement or dread? Do you seek it out? How do you respond when it's forced upon you? I was just kind of starting off on building my own adult life and figuring out where everything was going to go when everything shifted for me. <laughs> All the nerves at the base of my spine that are supposed to be free floating are tied into two tumors and they're slowly killing off the nerves. So every time I move, it pulls on the nerves and damages them more and causes a lot of pain for me. Um, so I'm slowly deteriorating in that way in my, in my nerve function and mobility in my legs. When I first started to realize that this was a long-term thing and it wasn't just a glitch in my life that I was going to be able to overcome, I started um, feeling really depressed for a long time, looking at all the loss that I had. And I wouldn't be able to go to school. I wouldn't be able to get a job. I wouldn't be able to get married. I wouldn't be able to have kids. All the plans that I had my, for myself at 19 when this first really became a constant in my life uh, were gone overnight and it was really dark and really overwhelming and I had to take the time to move through that and really deal with it and process it um, in order to be able to start even considering that there was anything positive and good in it never could have imagined the kind of life I have now it's so opposite of anything I wanted or expected at that time but I found a, a place where I'm very happy and I created a reality for myself that I never thought could be. April loves tattoos. It's gonna sound strange, but having the pain of the needles is actually very therapeutic and it calms down the rest of the pain in my body. That and doing circus. <laughs> so it's these very physically demanding, very painful, challenging moments that actually calm down the everyday pain and allow me to, to have a moment's reprieve. So. I know that most people in society will never look at me as a whole human being, which hurts. In actual fact, April is more active than the majority of able-bodied people in Nova Scotia. She sails. Yeah, SailAble is basically an adaptive sailing program. We also have some people who have no hand function at all who sail using sip and puff technology. There are two straws that's up by their mouth, so you can be completely in control of a 16-foot sailing ship. As a person with a disability, I was told that there's nothing you can do. You just have to sit back and watch other people live their life. And then to be able to get behind a ship and take control and realize I can do this on my own and I still have a lot of abilities here. She's heavily involved in theater. Rolling Bold Productions, they were looking for an actor who used a wheelchair and it was really amazing to be welcomed back in that way because I've been creative behind the scenes for so many years, but to have that immediate connection with the audience again and also playing a character in a chair and just putting it out there that this is me and, and this is part of my life was really, really special for me. Once a year when Fringe rolled around, I'd volunteer, usually selling tickets. I was very, very honored in 2017 when they asked me if I wanted to be the chair of the festival. Number one, because I have a disability and just to have an organization 
trust somebody with a disability that no, we know you can still lead us as a company and we have faith in you that you'll make the right decisions and, and be a good leader for us. So that was very special. But also I was the first woman to be the chair of the Halifax Fringe Festival um, after 20 some odd years. Legacy Circus is a, an adaptive circus troupe here in Canada. I couldn't imagine getting on stage in my wheelchair and lifting it up in the air and swinging from a trapeze with it. Yeah, there were so many parts of it I couldn't imagine as possibilities then. She even surfs and is a midwife. One of my professors uh, and one of my mentors there uh, studied a lot of uh, native midwifery. And uh, I happen to be one of the few native students in the class as well, because I'm Mi'kmaq. Um, and one of our uh, first births that we needed somebody for as a student uh, was a young woman who was native and only wanted other native women in the room with her. So I was chosen as the student to be there. And it was amazing. They had drumming the entire time as she was in labor and they did the birch bark canoe for the first bath. It was a really spiritual moment. I always wanted to be a mother from the time I was very young started babysitting when I was 11 years old um, and just always had lots of kids around me and knew I wanted to be a mom and have a big family. So um, I was 19 when I, excuse me, when I discovered that I couldn't have kids. And that was a really big loss at the time to know that that part of my life and that expectation would never happen. And it took a long time to mourn that. And there's still a lot of days when I'm, I'm still mourning it. Your passion and your knowledge and the way you see the world. Um, it's hard to know that I won't be able to pass that on in a traditional sense, but I feel I've found a lot of ways to pass that on to the community in general. April is a fierce advocate for people with disabilities. Back then when I left Yarmouth, I couldn't even think about some of the dreams that I have now or imagine myself as the person I am now or involved in the activities that I am now. Now with COVID, April and her partner have to face challenges most of us would never comprehend. A lot of individuals with disability, when they go into hospital during COVID, are seen as not worth saving. Would he get the care he needed? Would he get a ventilator if he needed one? It's very unlikely. Uh, for In the disability community, even people who require ventilators every day have had them taken away during COVID because they're needed more in another place. And the life of somebody with a disability is seen as less important than the life of somebody who's able-bodied. April says the disability community does not have the same rights. So there's a lot more challenges there of how do I survive when my life is not seen to have value. Lynn's life is all about change. And now, without further ado, we would like to have the woman of the hour and the collection come and say a few words. What Lynn has wanted to change are attitudes and injustices. I worked in various programs in the community related to uh, things such as affordable housing. She was then hired by the federal government as an employment counselor. Itinerant employment counselor because I spent half a day in the traditional employment office and the other half of the day in the community, in this case the largest black community per population in Canada, to help them train and develop for the employment opportunities. Throughout her career, she fought for change. Thank you, thank you so much. Working on employment equity or as president of the local trade union, she fought for employees' rights. Lynn Jones is a long time 
community activist and, and labor leader and just amazing individual in this city. So make some noise for Lynn Jones, everybody. I know that Nova Scotia has a bad reputation for how it's treating black workers and black people in general. Change should be her middle name. She was the first black person to join the exclusive ranks of the Canadian Labour Congress. She received the Queen's Medal for Outstanding Service and an honorary doctorate from Acadia University, plus many other accolades and awards throughout her stellar career. Lynn is also a musician and competed in the 1969 Summer Games. She comes by this drive honestly. Her grandfather served in the First World War as one of only 16 African-Canadian armed soldiers. There was the number two construction battalion, but they were not allowed to carry guns. This is my grandfather, Jeremiah Jones. He lied about his age uh, so he could get to fight. My grandfather was recommended uh, because of his brave bravery. They sent him in on a suicide mission. Regiment could not get uh, over the hill at Vimy Ridge and there, because there was a German machine gun nest between them and getting to the top. So my grandfather was sent all alone to into a German machine gun nest to spy for the, the Allied forces. He actually spoke German and he was also trained in German military tactics. <laughs> He single-handedly cleared out the whole nest all by himself. The rest surrendered and he marched them back to his commanding officer and uh, threw down the guns and said, are those guns any, any good to you? He never received his Distinguished Combat Medal recommended by his commanding officer, but after unending efforts, he was awarded posthumously a medal for bravery. One hundred years. This is calling a hundred years since that original battle. And today, doing uh, some of the interviews, one of the questions that is always asked is, do you think things have changed? <laughs> do you think things have changed? How do you answer that? Is 100 years later, we're still fighting to be included. B did not seek change. It was thrust upon her. Everything is perfect and you think, oh, my life is amazing. And then, boom, the war starts and then you get everything out of control. So from having beautiful life to ending up to the camp with six children, it wasn't easy. And when you go there, you see the people who are sick, who are not in a good shape, who are miserable, and you think, what's the next step I'm gonna take? B is haunted by an image. Her eldest daughter crying out as she watches her family leave a refugee camp in Kosovo for Canada. I was doing a haircut when my daughters came and said, Mom, our names came on a list to go to Canada. She was tearing up. She said, it's Canada, Mom. And Still sometimes. <laughs> it still hurts me to tell this story. She was engaged uh, and her fiance was in Switzerland. So that's why she was crying because she knew. Uh, she didn't know what to do. She knew if she comes with us, she will have to leave her fiance behind. And if she stays there, God knows when she will be able to see her family. It was heartbreaking, you know. She was, Mom, how can I live without you guys? I said, you're going to be okay. If you love your fiancé, you better stay. In the evening, she said, it's okay if we sleep together tonight. So we both of us <laughs> slept one sleeping bag in a tent, hugging each other for a whole night. She was crying, and I was crying all night till next morning. And then next morning we took a flight and I left 
her with both hands in a fence, hanging like this and crying. And I didn't know if I ever gonna, I'm gonna see her again. The youngest one were sick and my heart was broken, split into pieces. We came to Canada and then at the air, airport when we arrived, it was so much a difference leaving everything behind, being forced to leave your home, and then coming in a country which no one knows you basically, no one knows. And everybody was giving us beautiful smile and waving and applauding, and I was, wow, this is amazing. And then how I, that's the way I start thinking positive. There is a chance. I can have a life with my family here. So here I am 21 years later doing a haircut. Back in 1998, Bee never imagined how her life would turn out. I have 15 grandchildren and 16 is on the way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, um, so they're gonna be 13 boys and three girls only, oh. <laughs> Bee's daughter did, in fact, marry her fiancé. Unlike Bee, Ian willingly sought change. I've gone through quite a lot of change in my life. I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be a journalist. And I didn't. I became a marine engineer, and uh, and I, I went through some other, you know, significant career changes in my life. And you know, sometimes I'm embarrassed when I think about them. But but I think one of the things I learned was that um, your personal resistance to change really is a fear. <clears throat> it's an emotional, a psychological, uh, you know, element of of being human. I think you know, and. But the other side of that coin is that opportunity comes along. I've heard enough. Miss Diggs, your point is taken. True, Miss LeBlanc is not guilty of a presumptive offence. But I cannot agree with you that her crime was, in and of itself, non-violent. Your Honour. I'd been working in the Middle East, uh, consulting, and really enjoyed that, that, that work. But I came back and I was quite burnt out. And I decided to take some time to rethink what I wanted to do. I was encouraged by my wife Mary and I decided I want, I'm going to write a screenplay. It had been an ambition for decades, to be honest. Just that decision was a big change. And then at the same time, uh, I had an opportunity of getting into some acting. And, and that, again, that was something from my youth and my younger days that I wanted to, I decided to re-explore again. Certainly making those two decisions, writing and, and getting back into performing arts, uh, has really changed a lot for me over the last uh, about seven years, I think. Yeah. You know, I, I came to Canada when I was t 20 and it was quite a change, you know, even although I'm Caucasian, male and so on, it was significantly, it was still a, a, a jump for me. I got a subscription to Maclean's and I got a sub subscription to Sports Illustrated and just reading those all the time kind of really helped assimilate me, at least I under began to understand the environment I was living in. Ian does have one big regret. I was really into writing back then. Peter Capaldi, who became Doctor Who, 
him and a few others from, from that class at high school, we were involved in a theatre group. And when I look back, I, the two things were, should have continued acting, even if it was amateur theatre, doesn't matter. And I should have, I should have pursued my passion for writing. I actually had a part-time job in a newspaper in Glasgow and those journalists would say, don't, no, don't do this as a career, son. You'd be better off, you know, do what your dad did and be, be an engineer, right? So I did. And, you know, it was a regret. I used to stay in my room when I was a teenager and, and write, you know. <laughs> my mother wondered what I was doing, like it was, I was out there like, doing drugs or something like that, because every now and again she'd come with a, a cup of tea going, you all right, son? And, you know, give me a cup of tea. <laughs> and, I, and all I was doing, and I had an old typewriter and I would just batter away at and God knows what I wrote, I have no idea. For Patricia, life came with many challenges starting in her childhood and continuing into adulthood, resulting in a struggle with self-image. I've been through a lot of changes. <laughs> I grew up in a family of seven. My father was very abusive. I don't believe in violence against violence at all. But at that point in my life as a 13-year-old girl, being scared of my father, my stepfather actually, and um, you know, not wanting him to hurt my mother anymore. Um, I stood up, I got really brave, and I you know, said to my siblings, if dad ever hits mom again, then we're gonna take charge. So from that point on, he was pissed, <laughs> but he never put his hand on her again. It is hard to believe when you look at her beautiful essence now that Patricia had low self-esteem growing up and well into her adult life. At that point, did not feel good about who I was. I didn't think that I could do anything effectively. I grew up in an era where being black was something that I did not want to be. Patricia got pregnant at a young age and married, but it was not a good fit, so she ended up being a single parent. Raise a son who's five, <laughs> do homework at night when he's asleep, <laughs> go to school the next day. Working through her struggles has allowed Patricia to impact the lives of others, both through her professional counseling and her considerable musical talent. I love working with people, I love seeing a shift. I love seeing how people learn and also take what they learn and br bring it into their own lives. It's all changing, like the weather. She helped others, but she couldn't help herself. And then all of a sudden, marijuana was an issue, wasn't an issue, but alcohol became an issue. Um, and so I drink a little bit and then it got to a point where it was really out of control. Finally, I just went, you know what, I can't do this. I can't live my life like this. If I continue to live my life like this, then, you know, everything is going down the tubes. I lose my husband. I lose my singing because of my voice. I lose my friends. So I just decided, you know, this, this can't work anymore. So um, substance abuse can totally destroy your life. And... It's hard, it's not easy, it really isn't easy, but one day you have to wake up and say, enough is enough. You got the power, you got the power, you got the power. You go through life, separated from your source. Not knowing 
most people fear change because they don't know what the outcome is going to be. So it's, it's to actually look at what you have now. Look at what that change is going to be, per se, um, and then back it up. COVID-19 is a change, okay? It's something out of our control. So I look at it in terms of I can't control COVID-19. What I can control is how I, how I live my life based on what's going on. Although now retired, she is still pushing for change. We're looking at putting together this task force to start to look at the issues of racism in, in, the, in the town of Bridgewater. COVID has thrust changes on many, even children. My name is Ryan Lennon, and I am six years old. Tell me what change means to you. It means, like, say something happened, like something you don't know what's going to happen in your life, but then it happens. Okay. So can you tell me about something that happened in your life that changed your life? Uh, yes. It's called the coronavirus. Oh. And how did the coronavirus change your life? Because now I can't play with my friends. So if you could change one thing in your life, what would it be? It would be, I would make sure none of my friends or anybody in the world to die. I miss my friends really bad. Born and raised in an affluent family in the Philippines, Joseph sought a healthier life for himself and his wife. There is so much corruption in the country. Uh, I thought maybe, I, I, I thought when I was still working uh, as an academic that I would be able to change people's thinking. As an academic in the Philippines, he tried to make a difference. Frustrated, he seized the opportunity to come to Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia where he could make a difference in another way. At Dalhousie, Joseph is studying the lives and rights of seafarers from around the world. And that's how he discovered the Mission to Seafarers, where he now volunteers. I found out about the uh, Mission to Seafarers when I started with my uh, doctoral studies. Joseph is very concerned by the way many seafarers are treated. They are not considered essential workers, even though he says they are responsible for moving more than 90% of the world's goods. Industry is also a, an invisible industry, invisible in the sense that they are not easily seen. Yet, despite the uh, efforts of the seafarers, uh, these are workers that have been uh, neglected. There are no sufficient implementation of existing regulations in order to protect the uh, well-being of these of this, uh, essential workers. He calls container ships floating cages, painting a picture of weeks on end, not seeing anything but huge metal boxes. And because of COVID, some seafarers have been stuck at sea for more than a year. Joseph tells a personal story many immigrants are familiar with enthusiastic recruiters telling them what a great opportunity Canada offers. And we need you uh, to, to, to keep the Canadian uh, uh, economy and society going. But despite the fact that both he and his wife are highly experienced, they can't find jobs. She was a chartered accountant for some very big firms in the Philippines for 20 years, but her credentials are not recognized here. Sound familiar? When we came here, one of the first things that she was asked when she first applied was, do you have Canadian experience? How can she get any Canadian experience? But Joseph isn't giving up on Canada. Simply rely on getting employed. Probably that is not where the opportunity is. 
but the opportunity probably would be us creating our own employment. Wow. You know, so that's that is now that has now become our our um, uh, our view of like how to survive in Canada. Rosalie started life in Lunenburg and after living in many other places has returned, launching her latest book, Broken Symmetry, in 2019. Her love of storytelling might have come from her father. He was a great storyteller. And of mm. course, what happens in a barbershop? People tell oh, stories. Course. And one of them I use in Broken Symmetry because I want it to preserve the word, Predge. There was this chap who was talking about the Capelin. He was a Newfoundlander and he said, at first they predge in and then they predge out and then they're gone and who knows where they're gone to. This, this man came into my father's barbershop and plonked himself in the chair and he said, if only I hadn't gone to that wedding. And uh, he told my father about how they went to the wedding and his wife at the reception was playing the piano and she was having a good time. And he said, I said, let's get out of here. Back they went to the house where there was a pot of yellow paint on the back porch. They somehow stumbled over this yellow paint and an already tense situation was further aggravated by the yellow paint. And he said, I said a lot. I guess I said too much. So when he got up in the morning, she was gone. If only I hadn't gone to that wedding. And so then he proceeded to ask my father all kinds of questions about housekeeping and cooking because he knew my father was a widower and my father would know about these things, you see. So my father gave him such practical advice as he could. And then he said, why don't you go and talk to your minister? And this guy thought for a bit and he said, I think I'll go and buy a bottle of rum. Happily, it was more of a spat not a serious fight, and they did get back together again. To say Rosalie's childhood was unusual is an understatement. Two brothers married two sisters, and my parents lived on one side of the house and my aunt and uncle on the other, and then another aunt moved in. I was the centre of attention and very very important. This was both a positive and almost certainly a negative. <laughs> I began talking at the age of 10 months and by about 18 months I was talking in sentences. I didn't always use this particularly well. Tact was not among my attributes. Uh, I went to a neighbor's house with my mother and I was crawling on the floor and got under the piano bench and I said, floor dirty, clean it. <laughs> and so I grew up in this house on the lower street and the lower street, I should say, has been greatly gentrified. It was not a nice place to be living in the 40s and 50s. And so I was, I was just such an oddball. And then by grade two, I came top of the class and that didn't endear me to oh, anyone. Her intelligence led her to many places. She was the first in her family to go to university. I won the Governor General's Medal. Mm -hmm. I was the first woman to be class valedictorian. And I have never in my life again been so preeminent among my peers. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> and sure. a word of advice, do not peak at 20 <laughs> unless you plan to die young. <laughs> After studying at Acadia University, Sizable scholarships took her to Bryn Mawr in Pennsylvania and then Cambridge University in England, where she met her English husband. At Bryn Mawr, for the first time, I discovered that there were people in the world who were quite as clever as I was, and some, shock horror, who were even considerably more clever. <laughs> and this came as a rather nasty shock. I would recommend that most people discover this at an earlier age than I did. All three of my academic books were published while I was in England. And then um, I began to write fiction. She and her husband lived in many places in Canada 
and then raised their children in England, but the sea always called to her. Finally, they made the difficult decision to say goodbye to their adult children and move permanently to Lunenburg. Rosalie has lived through many changes, but she is also a witness to the changes in Lunenburg. Lunenburg was not a classy place when I was a child. <laughs> it was a fishing town. And uh, now, of course, everything has been gentrified. The other big change, of course, is that the people in the town have changed. There are a large number of people who have come from elsewhere. But these people add something, I think, very important to the mix in the town. However, the other huge change that I've noticed is that absolutely no one goes to church anymore. Religion is done. And where did all the people go that used to be part of Lunenburg as it was? Oh, they died. One of the big changes in Jerry's life was meeting his future wife, Debbie, who persuaded him to try a different diet. I became vegetarian in February 89 haven't had a piece of meat or anything like that since. And the thing I noticed first, I dropped down to 145 pounds in about a year from doing nothing. That's the only change I made. The other change I noticed was stamina. I just had tons of energy. We got our stuffed mushroom calves. We've got a little sour tray with some pickled turnips and radishes. Fast forward to about three, four or five years ago, I was so close to becoming vegan the last thing that was on my list that I was eating was cheese. I hadn't had milk in 20 years. I, I don't eat eggs. And cheese was the last bit of crack cocaine that I couldn't get rid of. And Debbie said, why are you still eating that stuff? And I went, I don't know. I just like cheese. But finally I said, yeah, this is dumb. Why am I doing this? And I quit that too. I didn't notice any noticeable changes to my body or anything else after that. My weight stayed the same. But that is probably the single most important change I've made in my life. Getting rid of meat, getting rid of dairy. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer many years ago. And even as far back as 1996, she was invited to participate in the study um, to track uh, her consumption of dairy products after her diagnosis. So even way back then, I think a link was suspected. And that's just for the motivation for me to stick to the plant-based diet. We get some beets over top. The beet goes on. I would say the biggest change was actually coming here. We fell in love with it pretty quickly, just on a trip. And we've heard that from many other people who have come here. You know, had no plans to move here, but you come here one time, it's like, oh, this is lovely. So absolutely no regrets. And we couldn't afford to move back to Ontario anyway. I think we'd be living in a cardboard box under a railway bridge if we did, but anyway. But a nice cardboard box. True. Yeah. I was working seven days a week for the last six years of my career. I was getting extremely stressed out to the point where Debbie said my voice had changed, I had lost weight, and I wasn't sleeping. So we decided to come to Nova Scotia for a vacation, and that was all, and we fell in love with the place. We went back to Ontario and said, why are we in Ontario? We had a very difficult time telling our grown kids that we were moving. And when we did tell our daughter, her reaction was, good for you guys. She was really pleased for us, and you know, we're still as close as ever. A man at work said to me, you know, it's funny, Debbie, he said, when kids move out on their own, people say, good for them, you know, they're growing up and, and they're you know, moving away and finding their way in the world, he said. And when adults and parents, you know, move away, everybody's like, oh, moving away from the children, how could they? He said, and they, you know, try to make you feel guilty. So he said, uh, you know, good for you guys, it's, it's great, you know, and, and if you don't try something, you'd always wonder. A long time ago, I was married and ended up being divorced. And I have three children, but I had four dependents. And so it was a big change. But I adapted. And some of my friends said, I don't know how you do it. And I said, well, you don't think about it. You just do the things you need to do to survive and be happy. Dealing with what you've got to deal with today. 
Food was a big influence in Barb's decision to leave Sackville, New Brunswick and buy a hobby farm outside of Tadamagush five and a half years ago with her husband, Harold. The change was to live in the country. We had lived in, in small towns before that with, you know, small backyard. The idea was to live more sustainably um, and uh, have all the challenges of growing food and maintaining a big rural property. So the big change was a hobby farm. Aren't they beautiful? I think seeds are God. And I think that if this little thing with Hold like up. a minimum of effort becomes this, which smells and tastes delicious, then it's an amazing act of creation. So here's the results of our labor. Barb is a big planner. This chalkboard is a map of her new garden. It's in quadrants. This one's wild. This one's a mix of flowers and um, vegetables, and it's also part of the white garden. Everything here is the white garden, so that when you're in the house at night and you look out, you see white blooms. It's a challenge of living more sustainably. And the garden's a hobby, it's not a chore. So, although I am holding my, my to-do list that went from May 31st to June 20th, and it is um, 76 items long. <laughs> All summer I make sous and stew, sous and, that's a blooper, <laughs> stews and soups and curries put them in the freezer. I also dry things. And I, in the winter, we're quite lazy because every couple of days we go downstairs to the freezer, bring up a few days worth of food, and it's already cooked. She thrives on her garden care and loves her connection to nature. Although sometimes nature gets the better of her. So we have an orchard planted. Uh, it's not producing much fruit. Um, right now, the birds are getting all our cherries and the groundhogs are getting all our strawberries. <laughs> Like get that kind of pest management under control or grow enough for everybody. I don't know which. So really low on fruit, really high on vegetables. Um, we still buy rice and we don't make our own wine. <laughs> Even in childhood, we start to experience changes. Some small, some profound. This may determine how we respond in later years. Take Jack, for example. He reflects on changes in his young life. Well, when Ryan was born, that was a change. My life became more annoying and more happy at the same time. I have somebody to talk to and play with in quarantine right now. Meeting my best friend, friends, Rowan and Cole, changed my life. Before, I had two other friends at the exact same spot. Anyways, they were older than me and they got out of that preschool before me, so I had to make new friends. And Rowan and Cole just happened to be friends at the time and saw me sitting by myself and they came over to play. If you could change one thing in your life right now, what would it be? It would um, probably be coronavirus. I don't like it. How do you cope when overnight you experience sudden and unexpected physical change? For Khalid, it was by asking the question, do I choose desperation or faith and humility? I've always lived an active life, dancing and running and sports and all these types of things, and even up until the age of, in my 60s. And my aspiration was to go into this, what are called the Sydney's Olympics. Then a trip to his doctor changed everything. And he decided that uh, I should change my medication but something went terribly wrong. And now I'm hospitalized and I recall it was a feat when I was able to walk from the bed about 30 feet down the hall. That was an ac literal accomplishment. And so from then on, uh, life became a different challenge. Now I was a member of the Human Rights Commission and I campaigned heavily for things like, you know, uh, access and all these type of things and for wheelchair. I, I did this theoretically. I recall the first time I was walking and I hit a bump and I fell flat on my face and, and split my lip and I laid on the, on the road and I literally cried because mm -hmm. I'm now challenged. This is a whole new world for me, right? And um, I then was able to put myself into the shoes of people who at one time I was trying to advocate for. 
and um, I start to see the importance of, of things like that. So change to me has been real because I now know what it is to uh, become challenged and I know also what it means to look beyond challenges and continue, but uh, whatever I've lacked in physical ability has come together in an amazing way in other uh, forms. So um, I don't think that what I'm able to accomplish has been actually limited at all. If anything at all, it seems as it's, um, it's uh, been a springboard. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of welcome change as opposed to sort of um, uh, mourning over it, over the facts that, uh, that life has, has, has changed for me. What happens when a partner of 25 years takes their own life? How do you recover? And what do you do to help your family? We were almost finished raising our four children. And um, he took his own life in August of 2015. And in retrospect, I realized it had been coming for a long time, but it was, it was a big shock when it actually happened. In an afternoon, overnight, everything, you know, everything changed. I had to leave our home, um, my 12-year-old daughter. He had left me writings to say that um, encouraged me to start over and go forward. Uh, I know he had intended it as a gift. We had this 25-year amazing, intense <laughs> experience. Uh, his sister told me that you guys fit a 60-year marriage into your 25 years that you were back there, and we did. So I think a lot of people can get stuck for a long time in the shock or the tragedy or what you left behind. But um, I guess because I had so much encouragement from him, and the better that I would do, the more that would help our children to recover from this, um, what could be quite a devastating and shocking event. Of her four children and two stepchildren, only one daughter was left at home. So she moved with her daughter to Lunenburg. I would say that was helpful in that I had someone other than myself to think about as well. That was a huge gift to me. So I've been living in Lunenburg for it'll be four years this uh, September. And I'm currently the director of a new senior center called Flourish, which is uh, still in its startup fledgling stage to be based in Bridgewater. And now with COVID and the internet expansion, you know, I'm thinking more like larger power. <laughs> you know, how we can serve more seniors in the area and how we can build uh, that community. I, I also returned to painting, uh, which was my major uh, in art college. And so it's a huge experience to get to um, have this stuff come out and like come to life. You know, actually be something that people are interested and respond to and like like looking at. Um, after thinking about this work for literally 25 years and in some part of the back of my mind. So, so if you were to see your 18-year-old self and you see now. Wow. My 18-year-old self? I feel like I'm a completely different person. Just all the changes I've been through at this point. Um, yeah, I'm so much happier. So much happier. Like, as my... You know, I, I think I would not have guessed I would be this happy at that point. I didn't even know that this kind of happiness was possible. Yeah. Uh, I just got engaged in January, <laughs> and um, we're trying to figure out how to do a wedding in the midst of COVID. <laughs> One of the most laid-back people dealing with change we met in the search for the art of change was Darcel. For me, changes are sort of a natural occurrence now. Um, I changed residence when I was in my late 40s. I lived in one city for my whole entire life until I met my husband, and then we lived in Halifax for a little bit. And then we ended up here outside of Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. So uh, big changes occurred, a new lifestyle, new neighborhood, new job, uh, new people that I meet all the time. So I, I know a lot about change. 
Um, I changed careers several times. Um, I've been a career counselor, uh, teacher, instructor. Darcel feels that having overcome many unwanted changes in her life has made her more accepting of change when it is thrust upon her. Our uh, world's changing, just our norms, our expectations, the way we do things, like just even going to get groceries. Uh, three months ago, we would never have thought about queuing up to get food or wearing a mask or standing a certain distance away from somebody, but we're, we're doing it. But um, this year, I think particularly with the isolation and the quarantine, um, you sort of find out what you're made of. And because I've been changing or having so many things change in my life so much, I just sort of rolled with it. <laughs> Some people really find it difficult to stay home and, and um, adapt to the new way of, of working. And I just rolled with it where I just uh, hunkered down, set up my office, set up my computer, and just went to work. Unlike the others featured in this video, Monty did not seek change, nor was it thrust upon him. In fact, he is living in the very place where he grew up, his grandparents' house. As a little boy, he so resisted change that when his parents moved, he ran away. I used to run away and come out here and then they had to come get me. <laughs> But we need the Montys of this world, as you will see. Monty ended up living with his grandparents in the house he now owns. Well, I don't know what age I would have been when I started milking cows, but I wasn't very old, probably seven or eight years old. And then I'd drive them to the pasture in the morning, then I'd go to school. <laughs> he worked at the fish plant first as a summer job. And then I got a year-round job. I worked there for 12 years, I think, in National Sea. The big change to many on the south shore of Nova Scotia was when Michelin moved into Bridgewater. Here again, Monty proved to be a hard worker, willing to take shift work. People like to go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, come home at 5. But you, you don't do that at Michelin very much because it's 24 hours a day. But things is going to change <clears throat> with all the sickness and stuff that's going on. They're very fortunate to be living in Kingsburg, quite frankly. We have a lot of open space here and we, we, we can keep safe. And now because of COVID, many people are rediscovering the old ways. The ways people like Monty have kept alive. Self-sufficiency, gardening and honoring nature. They were very self-sufficient here. They planted all their own vegetables and, and they had, we had beef cattle and we had pigs and the kids today wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. They would not know how to survive if they couldn't get a, buy a can or something. Mm -hmm. It's just unfortunate, really. But some of these skills are coming back. You know, people I, are learning. Like they're I worried about putting food up. All these people growing gardens who didn't know how to, and it's like a new thing for them. That's, so it's kind of interesting. These old skills. Are, it could be a, a life a cycle change. Yeah, as yeah. time goes on. Yeah. To those who have taught us to face change with courage, thank you. To those like Monty, who have preserved the old ways. Thank you also. You, too, are an important part of Nova Scotia's beautiful fabric. Change has been forced upon the entire world. COVID has forced young people to learn the old ways of gardening, preserving, and being more self-sufficient. I think to fear change is to be stagnant. I think if you fear change, any kind of change, whether it's technological change, change in your relationship, a change in your health, it's something that doesn't necessarily has to be overcome, it has to be met. When people uh, get fixed, fixed notions of where they should be um, and how things should be, as opposed to how things are. And when you have this, then you have, uh, along with that becomes disappointment, frustration, and all these type of things because of it's, it's, it's going beyond what you expected. So expectations and all these type of things are, uh, are a hindrance to resilience. I read something the other day that said, feeling discomfort is the only time 
that you're growing. You know, you can't expect a life that's just going to be smooth sailing all the time. Change is inevitable. So I think being flexible and embracing it when you can and just making the best of it when that's the best you can do is perhaps the best advice. I think if I had have just jumped to looking for the opportunities, I wouldn't have had the time to fully mourn the loss of what I had missed and, and to really move through those emotions that come with that. Um, I really had to take that time to sit in that and experience it and feel just how horrible that was and be pretty grouchy sometimes and push away the people that were closest to me. Um, and really deal with the depression before I could get to the positives. I would say that change is a constant, whether we like it or not, it will eventually uh, uh, happen. It's more of how we approach the change that makes, uh, uh, that would probably contribute to uh, how we can improve our lives. We all have in us the, the ability to adapt to change. Uh, some better than others, but I think we'll get through this.